We've seen how base clauses grow from the most basic kernel sentences into longer, more complex sentences with greater specificity and idea-carrying capacity. What sentences can also do is grow beyond their base clause. There are essentially two ways to do this, by connecting additional clauses or by adding loose modifying phrases. We'll get to loose modifiers soon enough and have a lot to say about them too, but for now we're going to stick with the clause theme. This lesson is about figuring how clauses connect and grow like links in a chain. But first, let's do a quick overview of what a clause is to refresh our grammar memories and to use that as a foundation for growth here. A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a predicate. What makes a sentence different from a clause is that a sentence, in addition to having a subject and a predicate, must also express a complete thought. Here's an example of the difference. Julia wondered a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought, who fell off the bed in the middle of the night, a subject, a predicate, but not a complete thought. This clause cannot stand on its own. It needs something else to complete it, like a question mark. Clauses that can stand on their own independently are called independent clauses, and clauses that depend on additional supporting information to complete them are called dependent clauses. One can elongate the base clause of a sentence by adding dependent or independent clauses to the base clause. Let's see how this might look for dependent clauses first. David wanted to know more about the snowmobile for sale, which Tiffany had told him about. Here, we've simply added clarifying information that informs the reader who told David about the snowmobile. This is a common tactic for growing a sentence beyond the base clause, and theoretically, if one so desired, one could continue to connect dependent clauses to this sentence for a long, long time. David wanted to know more about the snowmobile for sale, which Tiffany had told him about, because she'd heard about it from her father, who worked with a guy from the North Country who went snowmobiling every weekend in February, which is a great month for snowmobiling with new friends, who will usually have a very nice time learning the sport, which is growing more and more popular with millennials. That sentence is grammatical, and... It would continue to be grammatical for about as long as I cared to keep that train rolling, but dear God, Ro, why would you do such a thing? There's a good reason you don't see a thousand dependent clauses strung together like that very often. If we're thinking at all about reader sensitivity, and we should be, we can easily say that this is not a smooth, enjoyable spin around the dance floor. The reader's focus, which begins with David and a snowmobile, gets moved from David to Tiffany, then her father, then a guy from the North Country, and by the time we're done, David has been left in the dust, and so has a lot of very specific yet irrelevant information the reader has very little reason to care about. It's a monstrosity, and probably not the most effective way to grow a sentence into something aesthetically pleasing. But these dependent clauses are very good for conveying specific information. Last Thursday, at midnight, Mario was present at the club which was nearly empty when the defendant entered and began speaking to the victim, who was sitting in the corner opposite the entrance with a few of his colleagues, all of whom were very drunk. Again, the reader's focus shifts from Mario fairly quickly, but in this case, the specific information in each dependent clause tells the reader something important about Mario, that he was one of the few people at the club when the defendant entered, and that he saw the victim there with his drunk colleagues. Each of the dependent clauses informs the reader what Mario might know about the situation. Even though the sentence's focus shifts quite a bit, it's still quite a useful and informative sentence. And this is what dependent clauses are good for when added together like this. They can add precision and specificity at a time when both are needed. But there is probably a hard ceiling on how many of these dependent clauses you can stick together before your reader checks out. This is one way to add links to the chain. The next two ways to connect clauses involve independent clauses. These are clauses that could stand on their own as sentences. To join independent clauses, though, we're going to need a little help from a few friends, the colon, the semicolon, and the coordinating conjunctions. Let's begin with a look at how the colon and semicolon work, and then we'll slap a few independent clauses together and see what happens. One of the jobs of the semicolon is to join two independent clauses that are closely related. That could look something like this. The doctor gave me some troubling news about my lab results last week. Plus, she wasn't happy about my platelet counts being so low, which would yield 
The doctor gave me some troubling news about my lab results last week. She wasn't happy about my platelet counts being so low. It's important to keep in mind when using the semicolon to join two independent clauses that the information in both clauses should be closely related. A sentence like this is a non sequitur. The weather was amazing in Barbados. I really hate those short connection times when we fly through Atlanta. It's grammatical, yes, but there's no reason those two ideas should be joined. This could work, though. I really hate those short connection times when we fly through Atlanta. We had to sprint to catch our second flight. The colon does similar work to its sibling, the semicolon. One of the colon's main jobs is to join a second independent clause to a first independent clause in a way that clarifies or explains, like so. Kentucky claims to be the horse capital of the world. Every year, the Kentucky Derby is run in Louisville, offering up what is often called the most exciting two minutes in sports. One way to be sure that the use of a colon is correct is to replace the colon mentally with the phrase, that is. With the sentence above, it would sound like, Kentucky claims to be the horse capital of the world. That is, every year the Kentucky Derby is run in Louisville, offering up what is often called the most exciting two minutes in sports. The second clause explains why Kentucky makes the claim in the first clause. If the second clause didn't explain the first, the that is would seem clunky and out of place, as below. Jared and Shana met each other at the airport bar. In his glass was a scotch, in hers an apple martini. Jared and Shana met each other at the airport bar. That is, in his glass was a scotch, in hers an apple martini. That just doesn't quite work. In this case, a semicolon would probably be better if you think these two independent clauses must be joined. Sometimes it's a tough call between a colon and a semicolon when joining independent clauses. And, truth be told, it's probably only the most scrupulous editor who would even notice if your semicolon should be a colon or vice versa. Like anything in writing, using constructions with colons and semicolons takes practice. Write 20 or so of each and it'll become part of your sentence game. The last and most common and useful way to join independent clauses is with a comma and a coordinating conjunction. This sentence construction is extremely versatile. Coordinating conjunctions are your friends, and, luckily, there are only seven of them, which makes them easy to memorize. Pause the lesson and say the following list ten times fast. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. And, but, or, for, nor, so, and yet. That should be stuck in your memory now. The coordinating conjunctions offer writers a great range of flexibility in the types of independent clauses they can connect. They allow you to add useful related information. The park on Sunset Boulevard has barbecue pits and picnic tables. And they allow pets. They let you add contrasting information. I was going to invite Sandra to my party on Friday, but I thought better of it when she cussed me out for no reason. They allow you to convey options. There's a movie starting in 10 minutes, or we could go to Sangria's and get a cocktail. They offer a good way to render an explanation. I couldn't figure out how to get the damn thing open, so I cracked the packaging with a hammer. You get the idea. Coordinating conjunctions are extremely useful. One thing to be mindful of here, though, is the temptation to grant other lesser words the coordinating conjunctions magical powers. One of the commonest writing mistakes is the dreaded comma splice, also known as a run-on sentence. This often happens when a writer treats another joining word like one of our seven magic words. This is a no-no. Bryant was a heavily sought-after bassoon player in the underground woodwind jazz scene. Also, to no one's surprise, he was a giant hipster. That's a run-on sentence as written. Nice try, also. Only our seven magic words can do that. This sentence would be fine with a semicolon, though. Bryant was a heavily sought-after bassoon player in the underground woodwind jazz scene. Also, to no one's surprise, he was a giant hipster. The problem with run-ons is that they confuse readers. The previous sentence isn't the worst offender, but it's definitely better with the semicolon. That lets the reader know that the first thought is complete. They can stop focusing on the subject and move on to the next thought following the semicolon. Conjunctions and punctuation, when used properly, serve as helpful guideposts to direct your reader's attention to changes in focus or the end of a complete thought. Using them well will help keep your reader in lockstep with you, the lead dancer. Those are the three ways you can grow your sentence by connecting clauses to the base clause. 
As we saw early in the lesson, there's a bit of a hard ceiling attention-wise when building sentences this way. Too many dependent clauses will strain your reader's attention dangerously close to the put this book down now threshold. We'll get to exactly why this is in a few lessons, but next, we're going to explore the most flexibly fluid way to make long, flowing, glorious sentences. <laughs>